<laughs> Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, where truth equals reality, and truth is often stranger than fiction. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio. This is your host, Royce the Redneck Radio Man. And joining me today is Linnea Lee. We're going to be talking about her book of Atlantis, uh, at least for part of the show. But we also wanted to devote some time to a book she's got coming out in the near future that, uh, well, it deals with uh, the early church and some of the things that not everybody knows about the early church. Uh, she told me that the title of the book... Uh, Yesterday, I think it was on the phone, and I'll be doggone if it's not slipping my mind. I think it was something about the restraint of the uh, apostles, if I, I mean the prophets, if I understood or, or remember it correctly. But we can get into that in a minute, and she can correct me. But for right now, let's go ahead and bring her on. Oh, wait, before we do, for those of you that have questions, the call-in number is 832-632-7904. And also, if uh, y'all want to learn more about Linnea, you go to www.linneaslayer.com. The link is under her picture uh, below the chat room and the phone information and the description there, along with a link to our book of Atlantis. And I'm posting this information into the chat room. Uh, Linnea, how are you doing today? Doing fine. Hey, Miss Maggie Weather. Now, I got a question in the chat room. Wanted me to ask you what your nickname is. Oh, here we go. I know, I know who that's from. Okay. I'm in a wheelchair. That means I sit. I'm a Taurus. That means I'm a bull. Yeah, sitting that's bull. We have sitting bull. <laughs> I, I saw that coming when you said you was a Taurus. I knew the rest. <laughs> yeah, yep. So, that must have been your other half with a sense of humor. My worst half. <laughs> I wasn't going to use that terminology. <laughs> but I do. <laughs> <coughs> How long have oh, you been married? Please pardon me. It's, uh, it's humid over here where I'm at. We're having rain every day. And that's affecting me and causing me to have extra congestion. So, just overlook that. Oh, I've been married for like 25 years. 18 for me. Oh, you see, you're just a newcomer to this. <laughs> My third one, I, I, no more. So, Linnea, you sent me a copy of your book, and I read it. And I, t- I tell you, it was a really a great book, and I got up to one certain point, and it tripped me out. Uh blew my mind for a minute there because uh, it time-traveled on me suddenly out of nowhere. Kind of shocking, huh? <laughs> but it was still a good read, and it was a very interesting story. And I could tell that a lot of it was, uh, you know, a novel that was based around research that you've done on Atlantis, evidently. Not necessarily. My mom was a teacher. She introduced me to Plato's Atlantis when I was five. Now I'm 55. I've had 50 years to gain all that knowledge. <laughs> so, not much research is all my head. Well, I don't know how much of that I can talk about without giving away too much of the book. Uh, I know that at the very end, that part you mentioned about uh, Orion's belt and the uh, Archimedes, is that something you'd be willing to share with them, or is that giving away too much? No, of course I had to bring extraterrestrials in. <laughs> about yeah, Archimedes? Yeah. Uh, family. Archimedes. Archimedes. Archimedes, however you pronounce it. But about him being an E.T., in other words, or a descendant of an E.T. Uh, Correct. You know, Correct. from the from the basis of the story, he would have been what uh, Zachariah Sitchin termed as a demigod. Right. Half human, half god. But you've also, I've, well, the reason I chose extraterrestrials for the book is if you know anything about Edgar Casey. I know he, almost everything about Edgar Casey. <laughs> he claimed he was led by the High Council of Atlantis. 
which consisted of 13 not of this earth. Think about this too. There are 13 crystal skulls of belief. I mean, that just fascinates me. There's something there. And in fact, your next book uh, after of Atlantis was called The Crystal Skulls of Salvation. Correct. That was part two of Atlantis. There's five volumes in all of Atlantis. Okay, now, how many of those volumes have been done so far? Published three to awaken in the archives. Part three is waiting in the archives? No, three have been published. Four and five are waiting in the archives. Okay. And what's the title of three? The Chosen. The Chosen? No, I'm sorry. Preordained. Preordained. Okay. Uh, now, I, I know we were supposed to talk about it of Atlantis and your new book that's coming out, but and this is sidetracking. But I haven't heard of preordained. Can you kind of give us a quick briefing on that one? Well, the only thing I can say it has something to do with the Orion history. Hawaiian? Of like Orion. Oh, Orion. The, the the star that Archimedes and his brethren came from. And according to Orion lore, there's supposed to be a crusader. That makes an appearance to right the evil. And that's about all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, though, it would make a lot of sense. And it goes along with a lot of uh, articles I've read online about Atlantis. A lot of people do believe that, you know, originally many Earthlings uh, started either on Lyria and came to Earth and became the first, um, you know, Atlanteans. And... You know, they were really from a more spiritually advanced uh, culture there. So they had abilities that we don't have now that we lost over a period of time. And that periodically an avatar comes back, which is similar to you, what you were saying. Exactly. There is no doubt in my mind or in my being <laughs> that Atlantis did not get it. There, it, 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 it existed. I get out <laughs> There's too much, when I did the research, I found that adds up to there was an Atlantis than that that adds up that there wasn't an Atlantis. I mean, even where I think Atlantis was is a strange area. Because, you know, most everything that happened on Earth, as far as with vortexes and stuff like that, is electromagnetic. We sure have a lot of them, those vortexes all over the earth, I think. That would be like a place that was like Stonehenge, Sedona, Arizona, where you can feel the vibrations of the earth. It's real. Now, some people would theorize that these um, monuments of Stonehenge and some of the others around the world, like Baalbek, were really uh, built by descendants of Atlanteans, if not Atlanteans themselves, or Atlanteans helping uh, the native folk. Well, if the Atlanteans were not there, I believe they used Atlantean technology. Or technology from another place, there is no way that I think, you know, like the Great Pyramid, they said it took 20 years to build. That's fine. But, I mean, they are it's like like to the the constellation of Orion itself it's white own I mean you know it has something to do with the equinoxes the vortexes energy it's all energy you know and, what and there's a place in Ohio where they say there uh, there's such a vortex that exists now that you can <laughs> go to and actually see it is I Understand it, if I understand it correctly. Hmm. We have a place like that in North Carolina. It's in the mountains, and I can't think of the name of the place, but it defies gravity. It, you know, the the you can feel the energy. I, I went there one time when I was younger, and it was just unbelievable. It was all energy. 
Well, you know, from what I've studied about ley lines, every site around the world almost, uh, you know, Stonehenge, the Great Pyramid, uh, the Baalbek, and, you know, what have you, is... Um, Machu Picchu. They're all, placed, <laughs> they're all placed on a ley line located at latitude 33. Or yeah. near, or near latitude 33. Did it ever occur to you that maybe these places were signposts for extraterrestrials to find their way around? I or thought about maybe that. Maybe dimensional doors, uh. Exactly, because it was Einstein that said himself, for each known dimension, there is an innumerable, innumerable amount of unknown dimensions. So, hey, he was one of the most brilliant men, I think, of the past 300 years. I believe him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I've read a lot about these vortexes, and I've never actually been to one and seen one myself. But it's not impossible to believe that they're around, and we don't know what all, uh, you know, the world's made of and our dimensions are made of. We don't know if there's any openings unless somebody actually goes and finds one and and can prove they found it in other words exactly right we live in a vast universe and i think i read on the nasa website that there are like 380 galaxies in our universe it'd be kind of us to be kind of you know conceited to think we were the only intelligent beings out there i don't buy it I think that'd be a little bit arrogant, to be honest with you. I mean, Absolutely. You're calling God wastefully, put all these vast planets out there, what, just so they can run around and play pool with themselves? <laughs> I mean, really, you know? But, you know, if people really want to know the history of our Earth, they have to dig. Because our history is below ground. That's like in the ocean. They don't even know what's in the ocean. And some of these places they find in the ocean, they're simply fascinating. But they have not yet found the lemon. They're not looking in the right place. Atlantis, Atlantis is right off the coast of Florida. Me and my son John were discussing about the location of Atlantis at the dinner table the other day. And he mentioned the Pangea theory. And what if Atlantis is now several different countries across the continents from each other, where when the uh, Pangea split up, uh, you know, some of Atlantis ended up by Europe, some over here by America, and it's no longer recognizable as it was. I disagree. No, well, we were I talking think, about this as a possibility. Right, but I think Atlantis was totally destroyed. But I tell you, it's in the area of Puerto Rico. 75 miles off the coast of Puerto Rico is Puerto Rican Trench. This thing is 5 miles wide. It's 1,100 miles long and 5 miles below sea level. We have not yet conquered that depth. When we do, I think they will find remnants. They may not find them. I don't think it will be intact, but I think they'll find remnants. Well, what do you suppose they haven't mastered that depth? I mean... Is it not safe for a human being, but they can send maybe a, a camera down there, maybe, that ain't a human being? I don't think they could even go that. I don't even think a camera would go that deep right now. Because you look at Titanic, it was, it's two and a half miles below sea level. And even that, you know, it's kind, was kind of chintz. So you're talking about two and a half more miles. <laughs> That's a long way. And it's, it's, if they ever overcome, overcome the water pressure, because if they were, to sit down like a little robot submersible, it'd probably be crushed or implode by all that pressure. Hmm. Unless they had some means of displacing the water around the immediate facility of the submersible. Well, if they've come that far, I want to know. Because I don't think so. Well, I'm just thinking about what would be a way they could if they wanted to. But my guess is they're just not trying to find a way to get down that far. Absolutely. Well, that's like in the next book I'm writing, which is nothing about a lettuce. 
I just think, you know, we haven't been told everything about our history. Which is part of the reason why you wrote Atlantis, wasn't it? Yes. And what we didn't know at one time has been lost over the years. That's like you go to Egypt and you think about Alexandria, Cleopatra City, that the library was, that was burnt. There's also another one called the Labyrinth. They have found where it is. But why won't Egypt let them dig? They've also found tunnels and caverns beneath the piles of the Sphinx. But Zagor Casey said that would be the Atlantean repository. It's there. It's caved in. But we can't dig. Why? Okay. Now... One of the guests I asked how the sound was okay mentioned that you could be louder. He was having a little trouble hearing you. Uh, and I turned the broadcaster up. I'm waiting to see if he uh, can hear better now. I don't know if it's in my settings because uh, he's had trouble understanding guests before, and it could be. I just haven't got my settings quite down pat for my guests yet, but I thought I'd mention to you. Uh, she well, said maybe hey, a small you, bit. Can you hear me better? He'll probably tell you in a minute. Uh, now, your book that you got coming out soon about, is, was the right title, The Restraint of the Apostles? Restraint of the Prophets. Of the Prophets. Now, uh, is that also going to have a connection to Atlantis somewhere? No. Totally different topic. Totally, totally different. This is about the religion that we've all been raised to believe. We've been raised to believe. This, I think, as far as religion goes, yes, there's a God, yes, there's a Christ, but we haven't been told everything. And in this book, I write fiction, which is great, because I can address some of the questions I have in the book. And that's exactly what I'm doing. Okay. Um, while you were tell- explaining that, I was making adjustments on the uh, volume as well. I'm waiting to see if he heard that, if it helped. Uh, I mean, on the uh, on my computer setting for the uh, virtual lines, maybe I thought maybe that would help boost it a little bit. So back to where we were at, though. Um, I read your ten page or you know copy that you sent to right. me on that, and a lot of the topics you're looking to cover or uh, there are things that's been out, but a lot of people, it, it hasn't been spread a lot. Okay, he said it helps when you speak up. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, things like the uh, Gospel of Judas uh, is one of the topics in there. It's been spread on TV, but there's still a lot of people that aren't familiar with the topic. Well, what I'm going to do in my book, I'm going to introduce the Testament of Lazarus. It's fictional, but Christ rose Lazarus from the dead. He would have been a better follower of Jesus than him. That's going to be part of it. And another thing I'm going to bring forth that I've always wondered about, maybe Judas was not the betrayer. Maybe he was doing as he was asked so that they could fulfill the prophecy. Which that's one of the theories that's been brought out recently, and there very well could be a, you know, something to that. Uh, that basically, in order for um, Jesus to, um, you know, pass on so it's for the resurrection, he would have had to have uh, killed himself, which is a no-no, or somebody else would have had to have killed him, or he would have died in an old age, which would have been, you know, after the time he was supposed to. In other words. You know, I believe, I'm such a fervent believer in God, that I believe that God told him what to do to fulfill a prophecy. I really do. I don't think Judas was a betrayer. I mean, that's me. That's what I get from reading between the lines. Well, he wasn't necessarily was one. I mean, the way it's written in the Bible, he definitely for sure was one, but... We know the Bible has been altered and 
you know, many different places for many different purposes. So, you know, we don't know how that one was told. Uh, we know that part of Jesus' prophecy was uh, fulfilling Joseph in the Old Testament, uh, you know, about the being sold for uh, silver and, you know, the other things that, you know, he did like him. Uh, you remember in the New Testament, Jesus said, uh, so is Noah, Noah, I mean, not Noah, but uh, Jonah went down into the well for three days and was lifted up. So the Son of Man must go down into the belly of the earth and rise up in three days. Uh, in other words, they do a mirror from Old Testament to New Testament. And, right. you know, he would have had to have been sold out in order to do that mirror of Joseph, in other words. But, Royce, that's what we have been taught. That's what everybody wants us to think. You see what I'm getting at? I just don't think it's true. I think I don't think we've been lied to. I just think a lot of what we don't know has been held back. Oh, I don't think uh, you're wrong. I think you're right. I'm just saying the way that it was presented turned it into something different. You see, Jesus could have been helping Jesus fulfill the prophecy of Joseph, and it was okay. It was meant to happen. But the church turned it into he was being a betrayer, in other words. Correct. You also think about this. When Constantine adopted Christianity as the religion of Rome, it was all political. Constantine himself was a pagan. You ask me, answer me this. If he was such a devout Christian, why wasn't he baptized into his deathbed? That's true. Oh, I there, that there is helps. another factor, too, and you brought it up uh, in that deal that you wrote to me yesterday. And this was about how did he uh, stake claim to, you know, apostolic descent from Peter? How did he claim that the Catholics were the chosen, uh, chosen church? And you can look it up in Wikipedia, and it'll tell you that according to the church, it was in that book of Matthew when Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And they tell him, uh, some say Elijah, some say John, or what have you. And Jesus redirects and says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the son of the living God. And it goes on to say, uh, well, blessed are you, uh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And then it goes on with the, um, you know, building his church on Peter. Now, that's a condensed version. But that's the part where they claim... Well, you know, Peter's our first, uh, you know, apostle, our first pope, and everything right. descending from him. But the thing is, all the popes were not Peter's descendants. That's one thing. But, you know, wouldn't it be funny if St. Peter, Peter's Basilica is supposed to be St. Mary's Basilica? Very well could be, but I'm just saying anyway that they never really established a, a lineage of Peter through the rest of the popes. And actually, there was no uh, popes in between Peter and the time of Constantine because there was no church. The church that right. started until Constantine. They, right, and then they, he, he had this council of Nicaea. We're talking men, men, flesh and blood men that chose the books for our Holy Bible. Now, are we listening to man's doctrine or is it God's doctrine? You don't exactly. Know. That, that's an and that's an important question because if you're listening to man's uh, doctrine, you're not getting closer to God. Well, exactly, and you know they could sit there and say, you know, they chose the books of the Bible that made Christ look divine and not human, but Christ was half human. I mean, you know, why could he be human and divine and say, job? Why not? It all goes back to the church. <laughs> well, the whole thing seemed to be about establishing uh, heavenly authority on earth. Well, the one thing, one thing I really, I don't trust Peter. And the reason I never trust him is because he challenged Christ. When, you know, Christ had chosen Mary Magdalene above the other apostles. And it was said he loved her among the rest. He loved her best. And then there's Peter. Well, who is she to leave the church and all this, you know? 
And then Levi came back with the sentence. If the master deemed her worthy, then who are we to argue? That's why I don't trust Peter. Was he in it for his glory or God's glory? Well, I think that whether you're aware of it or not, though, this here um, book you're working on now about the church really does have a link back to Atlantis, maybe not to your book, but back to Atlantis itself because... Uh, many believe that the original pure religion started in Atlantis and got corrupted over the millennia up to now what you see today. I was talking to my husband this morning. I asked a question. All these ceremonies that are done in Catholicism, who came up with those? The Catholics. <laughs> but why? I mean, you know, I want to follow God's doctrine. I don't care about man's doctrine. Because, I mean, you know, I hope when I die, I'm not going to be here among man forever. I hope I go home to the Father when I die, and I just want to make sure I know the truth. I mean, I bet there's plenty of people out there like me that wonder. I mean, God gave me a mind that if I'm doing, if I'm doing wrong by questioning, I'm sorry. But he gave me a mind. So I questioned. My odd question, too, I have for years, and, you know, but, you know, aside from that, for a minute, going back to the uh, of Atlantis book before we get off of it completely, I wanted to mention the fact that, although this is a novel, it does tell, you know, a lot of true stories, it's got a lot of true research in it, and it's, um, it's also sort of like a Dan Brown without being like a Dan Brown deal, in as much as like, it's an adventure type novel. Right. Um, All the historical facts in the book are correct. I'll stand by that with my life. But I did like Dan Brown. He presented the facts. Then he weaved his fantasy around the facts. Which is what you did. (laughs) Which is what you did, and I thought that was great. But, I mean, you had um, betrayal in there. You had war in there. uh, You had suffering. You had love. Um... You know, everything that makes up a great story, in other words. Right. And you put it together very, very nicely, I thought. Well, I think it did pretty good. That was the first book I ever, I ever, I ever did. And it, Novel, it, anyway. And the way you wrote it, one would almost think they were reading a page out of history that it had actually happened, in other words. Well, I look at it like this. As an author, my job is the content and the story. And this is a reflection of me. My facts are going to be right. Because, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to say, well, this ain't right. Look, I can see where it is in history. No, my facts are right in other words. Not arguing that. But when I chose the Orion as my little E.T. friends in the book... I was shocked to find out, like, you know, the pyramids on the Giza Plateau line up in total trajectory of Orion's belt. That Osiris is associated with Orion's belt. I said she is associated with Venus. I knew that, but I had no idea Osiris was linked to Orion's belt. Did not know until I did research. Well, you know, I've talked to a lot of people that have done, uh, you know, historical research on uh, <clears throat> these monuments. <clears throat> uh huh. Take Gary Davids, for instance. He's found out that a lot of the places that have these um, pyramids built, all of them are lined up like a star map of Orion's belt. You see? Why did I choose Orion? I mean... <laughs> That just popped in my head, so I used it. I had no research. I just popped in there, and I used it. Okay. Now, and that was when I learned of what exactly Orion's belt had to do with history and all that. I was flabbergasted. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, I kind of saw that coming, but then again, I've had a lot of research and a lot of guests on it. And that's why I saw it coming. 
But, uh, yeah, it leads a person to the question, though, why were our ancient fathers uh, laying out pyramids on the ground that would form a star map of this particular system? That's a lot of work to go to just to mimic a particular star system. And then every tribe all around the planet be mimicking the exact same star system. Exactly. And yet, according to archaeologists, which are wrong, our forefathers had no idea that each other were alive. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. <laughs> they knew. The Mayans themselves, they were very seaworthy because right off the coast of Belize, 400 miles to the south, they discovered an island that has an a Mayan like totem pole and it's 400 miles off the coast of Belize south I mean you know they were seafarers they got there but it's called Apocalypse Island and what they are saying is the island was meant for the kings that are going to come back to watch the galactic alignment it's going to happen on December 21st, 2012. Didn't know about that until the other day. Um, yeah, I've heard about this galactic alignment. Uh, you know, the Mayas, they were experts on star systems, and they would be the person who would know. Absolutely. And they were predicting, a, you know, some kind of thing coming up, but... Uh, no, they also, it wasn't going to be the end of the world, though. It was going to be an awakening, is how they put it. But what does that mean? Does that mean that we're going to be visited by our brethren? Does that mean there's going to be something traumatic that happens that wakes up the people to slaves? You don't know? And as far as stuff happening that's supposed to occur in 2012, it's already happening. That's like Thursday, this past Thursday. NASA monitored the biggest solar flare the sun has ever put out. That's scary. Because, you know, the galactic alignment that I'm talking about is a planet. We're talking about the Milky Way, the Sun, and the Earth in total trajectory of each other. Alright, the middle of the Milky Way is, the Mayans call it the dark rift. It's a black hole. And with black holes, there's intense gravitational pull. Now who's to say when all this is lined up, the gravitational pull or the solar, solar flares? doesn't affect our Earth. I don't know. It happens every 26,000 years. There's no written record. We don't know. Actually, no, we don't know. Uh, and our ancestors, the Mayas or any of the other ones, didn't really uh, get specific about that. They did mention that it would be a time of uh, trial, however. And we know that every uh, 26,000 years, or something close to it, there's a pole shift that may somehow be related to the phenomena, but these pole shifts have occurred before without destroying all life on the planet, but it's usually a pretty trying time. Exactly. But see, it's not only the Mayan that talk of this galactic llama, it's the Aborigines, it's... <clears throat> uh, they've got a thing in France, like I forgot the name of it, it's a stone, it's a Templar stone that shows the galactic alignment that's supposed to occur. I mean, you've got the Aztec, the Inca had something, the Hopi Indians, the Cherokee. I mean, you know, you can go on. Even the popes of their, themselves wrote a book in the 16th century. It was called Prophecies of the Popes. And one of the prophecies was this galactic alignment that's about to happen. And what makes it so scary is in the book that prophesied the next to the last pope will be named Benedict. 
The last paper is supposed to be called St. Peter. We'll see. Uh, that, gets, that gets a little hinky right here. Mm. Yeah, I guess it does. Uh, I've heard about this last pope being called Peter, but we don't know it for sure. We know right now Ratzinger is the pope, and I've seen pictures of him, and I swear it seems to me like every picture I've seen of him, he had an evil smile on his face. <laughs> Possibly. I've seen a picture floating around Facebook not long ago that had a picture of Darth Vader and the Emperor... And an, uh, another one right beside it of uh, Ratzinger. And the Emperor and Ratzinger both had their hands in the ha same position. And they were looking an awful lot alike. <laughs> well, reincarnation is a possibility. Very well could be. I look at it like this. If reincarnation were not possible, heaven would be a mighty crowded place. Just think of those that have died since the beginning of time, you know. It's unreal. It's, it's, it's unfathomable. I guess because I'm only a human, I just can't think like that. Um. But to me, I've always wondered also, like when you go back to ancient Egypt, you've got Isis, you've got Osiris, and then you've got Horus, their son. Christianity, you've got God, you've got Mother Mary, you've got Jesus. Coincidental, I don't think. I believe they've been worshiping the same God for a long time, just by different names. That leads us to another question. Did the Atlanteans have their own trinity? Did who? The Atlanteans. They may have. I wish I could go back in time, because one place I would go is Atlantis. Just to cure this seething fire I've got inside of me, my beliefs, what you know, I want to know. <laughs> well, while we still got some time rem uh, remaining, we'll shift back over to the uh, restraint of the uh, prophets. <clears throat> Did I get it right that time? Yes. Good. <laughs> I was a little worried about that. Um because, I mean, you didn't just cover the part about Judas. You also was covering um, the part about Mary Magdalene, uh, the part about Peter, uh, and him not really being the, uh, you know, rock of the church. And right. actually, from my understanding of that passage I quoted, what Jesus really meant was he was going to build his church on the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which is what Peter had recognized in Jesus. And that, that now, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't there a passage also in the New Testament where Judas calls him the Messiah? I don't remember that passage, but it could be in there. I mean, there's so much in that book, you can't yeah. remember all of it. <laughs> and I mean, I've been, you know, the book I'm writing now, The Restraint of Prophets, is about a biblical historian and archaeologist. And that is what I wanted to do. So I am, I'm very avid in my New Testament, but Old Testament I'm learning. Is this going to be like an adventure novel? It's going to be a little bit of everything in there. But instead of me knocking womanhood, uh-uh. Womanhood shall be praised in this book. Well, by the so. Is it going to be like, are, are they going to be in danger sometimes and having to run for their lives? and Possibly, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> but I will tell you this, one of the things they do look for is the temple of treasure. Yes. How did you come to select that as part of your feature? Because I, 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 I believe there was one, and I, I believe... I just believe, like I wrote in the book, it's not gold or silver. The temple or treasure are religious artifacts. And how I can link that, you know, when Constantine declared Christianity for Rome, he sent his mother Helena to the Holy Land. She found where Christ was born, where he died. 
But what about the small artifacts that she could have kept her Constantine? There's my Templar treasure right there. And it is not gold and silver. I will give you one hint. That's what my treasure is going to be. Think, think back to the New Testament, John the Baptist, when he lost his head. It was presented to Salome on a platter. Thus we have Salome's platter. That's part of the temple treasure right there. There were other treasures as well. I don't know if you're listing them, and I don't know if you want me to go down a list or not, but... uh. I mean, there was the Holy Grail, there was the uh, Spear of Destiny, but I don't want to go any further without knowing if I'm blabbing too much. <laughs> no, 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 no. Most of the facts that I, <clears throat> most of the religious artifacts that I'm using have not been, you know, written on like the Grail. I don't use the Grail. I don't use the Spear. I use other religious artifacts to prove a point. See, God wants this historian, her sister, and a nun to find the truth and present it to mankind, hoping there will be a renewal of faith in God. That's the whole point right there. Okay. Well, real quick, like, let's mention to everybody out in listener land that you're, you can get your books at Amazon, I think, isn't it? Exactly. Now, can they get the full collection there? Up to, up to volume three, yes. Four and five will be out before the end of this year. Up to volume three. And uh, now this here, Restraint of the Apostles, is it in any way part of the collection, or is it one totally no, by itself? totally by itself. <laughs> this is a book I've been dying to do ever since I started writing. But I had to feel that I was ready. Now I feel I'm ready because my other books, I mean, you know, they were a prelude to what I was going to do. The novel I'm doing now is one of the most important things I've ever done in my life. Because I'm such a fervent believer in, you know, we, we don't know the truth. We don't, we don't. And so what a better way than to address my questions than to write a book. Well, yeah, and, you know, we may not know any truths in this here lifetime. Uh, what I prefer to do is uh, not really subscribe to anything more than possibilities any more than what I have to. But I do have things that I believe are more likely than others, if you know what I'm saying. I do, too. <laughs> and when, like, when right. it comes to Atlantis, I think it's more likely that it once existed than it did not. I don't believe that ancient Egyptians recorded it on a stele and it didn't exist. I mean, nobody goes to this kind of work to record stuff for no reason at all. Well, you're right. No. I mean, I'm sorry. I don't mean to insult anybody, but human nature has a little bit of laziness in it and needs a little motivation. Exactly. And I don't know what happened over the past couple of thousand years, <laughs> but we lost a lot of what of what we need. I don't know how. That's like I believe everybody is a hybrid. I do believe that with my very soul. Because. So far they've unlocked like 5% of our DNA. And in each strand of DNA. There are thousands of chromosomes. And most of them have been identified. Except for one. And they can't find where it came from. I rest my case. Uh, somebody in the chat room is mentioning that they need to remind themselves of the uh, show time. And I was putting in the chat room, uh, asking them if they get the newsletter or not. And then I lost track of you for just a second, and I apologize for that. But I kind of get the gist of where you're going with that. Uh, I, I'm glad to see people like you that write about the books that you do write about. I mean, because it gets people to thinking and at least, uh, you know, talking about it. If they don't do anything else and, you know, trying exactly. to... Exactly, and then when ETs and and the truth re actually does come out, they won't be safe flabbergasted. 
Yeah, and there could be many a reasons why E.T. hasn't popped up in front of us yet. I mean, openly. I mean, uh, historically, there is evidence that we were visited back in ancient times. And um, there's reason to believe that they were run off the planet. Why would they be anxious to come back and get involved in something that didn't turn out well the last time? If they uh, Wouldn't they rather either leave altogether or monitor the planet to see if it would be different later on in the future? Well, I hope maybe they're thinking that maybe when we've grown up enough. Us to be able to accept the truth for a scientific perspective. Because I believe it's all looking at science. It has everything to do with electromagnetism. <laughs> Like all these ray lines stuff, it's electromagnetism. Our aura, it's electromagnetism. What are our spirits? Electricity, energy. Energy cannot be destroyed. It can only come back in another form. Right. And that's scientific knowledge there. So, I mean, you know, who knows? Now... I asked her in the chat room if she got my newsletter, and somebody else asked if, uh, no, said they didn't know what I was talking about. So I'm going to say this for the benefit of the listeners at YouTube and other places, that because uh, I always put on there they can sign up for a newsletter, um, just in case they never knew what I meant by that over at YouTube or uh, Daily Motion or Media Cafe. I just want to mention that when I say newsletter, uh, usually once or twice a week, sometimes more, I'll send out a newsletter saying what my next guest is going to be uh, so everybody can know in advance, uh, you know, what the show is going to be all about. And that way you got a chance to, um, you know, bookmark it or use it as a reminder or whatever you want to do. And you'll also be kept informed of what shows are going to be and what the guests are going to be. So anyway, reminder, folks, if you want to call in and ask a question, the number is 832-632-7904. Linnea's website, or Linnea's, I mean, www.linneaslayer.com. You can find her books at Amazon.com and probably Barnes & Noble, too, can't you? Oh, yes. <laughs> I think they're on everywhere on the computer to think of to get a book or download. My next question is, and it's got nothing to do with your books, are you still doing the uh, sound recording with Victor Ariellis? Yes, I am. Okay, I, just, I mean, uh, well, okay, I don't want to go with his real name yet, do I? I don't think he don't mind. <laughs> I, really, I was going to say, I met Victor Rossetti, and I said, oh, wait a minute, he goes by both. <laughs> yes, but, you know, in his real self, he's Victor really is the vampire. <laughs> <laughs> and if y'all go to her site, uh, www.Linnea's Lair, she has links to some of the... Um, sound tapes or CDs or whatever, uh, MP3s that you can download that they've made. And they do uh, dark poetry, isn't it, Linnea? Some, yes. Some, no. Mostly of it is dark poetry. And what's some of the other? Oh, I've written quite a few short stories that he's done. One is like Prelude to Oblivion. That's about the singing of Titanic, but think about on the floor of the ocean, the debris field. There's the face of a porcelain doll that looks up at the, you know, the sun. Prelude to Oblivion is based on the doll's face. Different. I've got another one, a long short story he did, called Boyana. That's about a psychic vampire. And I finished another book before, before Restraints. It's called Paradox Five. That is about Hitler's illegitimate unknown grandson and time travel. Time you travel. Should... That, funny you should mention that. I'm going to have a time travel show coming up in October, I think it is. E. But see what makes time travel so fascinating. Einstein gave a theory of how it's possible. 
And one of his things, I think he said we had to go faster than the speed of sound. And we'd never get there. Well, guess what? We did. We sure did. And if we can do that, then we can time travel. That's like the invi- inv- invisibility of something. All you're doing is bending space and time. The object is there, but you bend space. It looks like it's invisible. That's how it's done. So, mm-hmm. you know. Now, you said you got some other books you're going to be working on right after you get through the restraint of the prophets, right? Well, this, the next one after that one, I'm sure you will love. It's going to be about ancient aliens. Ancient Aliens, one of my favorite subjects. And I'm going to concentrate on 18th Dynasty Egypt. I'm going to write about Akhenaten. Akhenaten. Is Akhenaten uh, Akhenaten and Moses going to be one and the same? No. Okay. No, Akhenaten was King Tut's daddy, so... Uh, I'm going to call that, like, murmurs across time or something like that. Murmurs across time. Hmm. So what role does Moses play in this? Moses. I thought you uh maybe I, I just put that in my own mind because uh, you said Akhenaten or something. No, Akhenaten. He's, a, you know... King Tut's father. He was the one that tried to bring the religion of monotheism right. into Egypt. And this is why forth. many people think that Moses and Akhenaten were the same because they were around, uh, lived about the same time frame and um, they both tried to start monotheism. Well, you know, I believe that that might have been Christianity. The sun god Aten. I mean, you know, our forefathers would have worshipped the sun, and they would have probably thought it was the supreme being. But it's funny you should say that. I've seen videos on YouTube that indicated that the uh, Christianity today, the uh, especially the Catholic Church, is heavily into sun worship, and it's uh, it's revealed when you start looking at the symbolisms, like the uh, fish meter the Pope wears and other things. Um, that he has on his staff and uh, an amulet or some kind that he wears, all of it points back to sun worship, in other words. Exactly. The only thing that I know about the connection between Moses and Akhenaten is that that is Moses worshipped the same religion that Akhenaten did. Now, I've read that. I've seen that. That's the other correlation about that between the two. That very well could be. And that would explain why people think they're one and the same as well. Exactly. Exactly. Well, it, it is pretty obvious, though, that monotheism tried to get a start in Egypt somewhere close to four, uh, uh, 1400, you know, way back B.C., right. and it failed. And not long after that, it tried to get a start over in uh, Palestine, where it took. Oh, I'm sitting here thinking. Okay, they said, you know, when the slaves revolted and Moses showed up, it was under Ramses II, which that doesn't, doesn't blow me away because he ruled for so long, 67 years. Well, and, you know... It could very well be. I mean, you know, they've scientifically proven, proven the plagues. Even the last plague has been, there's a hypothesis. And it has to do with yeast and bread. They got by saying that the, the seed for bread, the top part of it would have been, ah, uh, it would have some kind of bacteria, and it was the same thing they say that happened as the Salem Bunch trials. I can't think of the name of that stuff. 
but you know the firstborn was always the first to eat and if that be the truth if they got a hold of that bacteria it could have killed them that's why the firstborn died makes sense to me well also there's many people that theorize that all ten plagues of Egypt could be accounted for by red tide exactly exactly all of them just uh, through a chain of cause and effect I mean the way that they've got the plagues laid out in the Bible they have proven scientifically that it can be possible the way they've got them laid out like you know from locusts to plot to frogs to the darkness I mean it can all be accounted for which is pretty fascinating uh, that it's all laid out right in order and and right in the exact correct order. Now that, there's something to it. (laughs) That's a lot of coincidence going on there. Really? You're not going to tell me it's coincidence. I don't believe it. (laughs) Well, since you mentioned the um, Mayans a minute ago, I thought I'd also mention for the listener's sake that my guest this coming Tuesday is Jim Ocon, and he's got a book out about the lost secrets of Maya technology. And it's a, huh? I said, Eve. No, I mean, the this is fascinate me. It's a really uh, in-depth study on uh, Maya technology. He covers uh, almost everything about them. And it's a, I've been reading his book, and I've come to find out that they were very extremely highly advanced, even more than what you see on the videos of the documentaries on TV. Yeah, they were, but, you know, I hate people to go out and do archaeology and present hypotheses. I don't want to know theory. <laughs> I want to know truth. Maybe I should change my name to truth. <laughs> now, Linnea, we was going to have you come back again further down the road when you finish the restraint of the apostles. And I talked to you about this earlier, uh, but you got you had to go for some reason. I forget what it was. <clears throat> but I asked you, and we can cover it right now, I got two copies of your book, Pray the Scavenger. One was for me. One was for a contest for the show. I was going to say, while the uh, listeners are listening, we can whet their appetites about the contest for the book because I was... I was thinking we could run the contest during your show, Restraint of the Prophets. Uh, what do you think? Sounds good. What I want to do is I want to pick out a question, a certain question that not many people would know the answer to unless they're really into this stuff like you and I are. <laughs> <laughs> and if they get it right, the first one that gets the answer right wins the book. Hmm. Okay, that sounds like it'll work to me. Of course, now, if we know too much, they're going to bone up on the subject. Now, which subject are you going to want to give them the question in? Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's either going to be Atlantis or religion, you know. <laughs> One of the two. That cuts it down a little bit. Not a lot. <laughs> But no, I'm one of your biggest conspiracy theorists there are. I was telling my husband the other day that if our brethren, you know, visited us and landed on the White House throne, Obama would say they were doing a Pepsi commercial. Because <laughs> yeah. I don't think he would pass up. Sandy in the chat room just made an interesting point. She says you can't find the truth without hypothesizing to some degree. Uh, sometimes the truth is elusive. Absolutely true. But while you're reading through a hypothesis and theory, you've also got to be able to read between the lines. Yeah. But you've got to remember there's also a danger when you think you figured it out, of finding out later you hadn't figured it out. So, you know, you hypothesize. You draw a conclusion, but I wouldn't etch it in stone and broadcast it as fact, in other words, until it was absolutely, you know, conclusive, in other words. Absolutely true. I write fiction, but just because I write fiction does not 
mean that I don't believe what I'm writing. There's a lot of things that I would tend to believe is highly likely that can't be proven. Uh, then there's a, uh, we're, we're in a world where you just can't have all the answers, especially when you're dealing with ancient history and ancient mythology. Uh, so many records have been destroyed down through the years, all the book burnings, uh, you know, looters of the tombs and, you know, what have you, that much of what was out there was lost. And uh, maybe. To some extent, yes. But you've got to remember, as an archaeologist, if you want to know the truth, you've got to dig. That is definitely true. Whether it be in the ocean or on land, you know? I saw an article not long ago that I didn't get to check out that said there was a a, a clear glass-like pyramid under the water over there by the Caribbean near Bimini Island. I hadn't heard of that one. A body would have a lot of trouble explaining how that one got there. Well, I do know that off the coast of Cuba, they did some underwater sonar of the ocean floor. And there are echoes of buildings underneath the ocean floor. I don't know what that is. Maybe it could be a last, maybe not. Who knows? Dig. Yeah, here's one that says, a pyramids of glass submerged in the Bermuda Triangle. Giant crystal pyramid discovered in Bermuda Triangle. But I haven't uh, had the time to really research that. But, um, you know, if they have actually found that, that is more uh, supportive evidence for uh, some of the finds of Atlantis, yeah. You think of this, though, as crystal, right? Yeah, crystal, which is... The 13 crystal skulls. Think about it. Yeah, a it crystal is a... a um, crystal stores information, too. A lot of people don't aren't aware of that. What are microchips made of? Crystal. Exactly. They also store energy. You got it. So there's a... I mean, uh, crystals is really made of quartz, and quartz is used in chips. It's used in TVs. Uh, you know, it, it transmits energy. It transmits, uh, you know, uh, sound. Uh, I'm not sure very, what all else. A very dear friend of mine that had the opportunity to see one of the crystal skulls. She didn't see the Mitchell Hedges, but she she saw the one they call Mac. And she said the energy that was emitted from that skull was just unreal. And I believe her. I've had a doctor. They should not be. The skull should not even be. They have a second hardest substance known to man in these skulls. There's no tool marks. There's no imperfections. There's nothing. They're perfect. So, this one guy that you know, investigate them so they shouldn't even be here because there was no way that man could have done it. I believe that. Yeah, believe I'm not sure how time. they shape those into crystals, but if it's true that if they're that hard, it would be even harder to shape one into a pyramid of that size. Not if you have the right technology. Who knows what technology our brethren has? Well, I know that they have technologies today that they can shape skulls with because somebody is making crystal skulls today. Yes, it's placed in China. And from what I understand, they carry the same kind of uh, energy properties as, um, you know, other crystals do, in other words. Yes, that place in China cannot get their skulls. As perfect as the skulls of belief. Now that is fact. But have we that. have we yet to find the original thirteen skulls? No, they've got eight of them. There's still what five more to be found. And they don't know now, where to look. They're going to find them around belief and in that area. Because it's close to where Atlantis was. That's what I believe. That's why you mentioned uh, 
<clears throat> Atlantis being close to Belize and uh, of Atlantis, then. You got it. Absolutely. You learn about tricks, Royce. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, you know, you've got a question. I mean, the Mitchell Hedges skull, which everybody says that Mitchell Hedges ordered it off of something back in the 1800s, which I don't believe. They were probably unheard of back in the 1800s. You're going to have skeptics. I mean, you're going to have skeptics. If he was standing right beside them, they wouldn't acknowledge it, you know. Now, where exactly is Belize? Ah, it's in Central America, Mexico. I'm thinking of... of what's that kind of North Not America. far from the Caribbean? No, all right. North America. All right, the United States. There's Canada, the United States, and Mexico. You're in Mexico. You go more to the right, to the east. Belize is the very last country before you get to South America. Okay. So and we don't South really America know. and Belize, they've been really busy. We don't really know then if maybe um, the Gulf of Mexico wasn't once uh, Atlantis, if parts of it ain't under the water there. I don't think so. I still believe it was between North and South America because of the ley lines, because of the vortex and the Bermuda Triangle. Look at the Bahamas. They are the most beautiful place on Earth, I think. And I believe myself personally that the Bahama Islands are remnants of what was left of the continent of Atlantis. Maybe the mountains, maybe the hills. You do know, though, that the Gulf of Mexico is just on this side of uh, the Bahama Islands. I mean, they're, yes, that is. they're close enough that Atlantis is big enough they can all be part of the same thing. Exactly. Is that and I found the map a lot. I forgot who did this map. But it shows where... North America and South America were connected. And below that is a big, big parcel of land that didn't have a name. And I believe that was the last. Now, this was a underwater map? No, it was a map made 980, 880, something like that. And what area does this map cover? The 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 Bermuda Triangle area. Really? Now that's interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, is this where land might have once been? Uh, that's yeah, under yeah. underwater yeah. now. Yes. Uh huh. That's just like I saw another map where it was showing Antarctica without ice. Right. Hey, how they know Antarctica was even there? Actually, how did they know what it looked like? They've proven that the uh, yeah. map was accurate and correct. How? How could they get the topography right? How? I think it was probably made before Antarctica iced over. But if they didn't know Antarctica existed, how in the heck did they get there? Oh, no, they knew it existed. Just nobody nowadays believes they knew. <laughs> but how did they know? Well, I'm sure that they had traveled it. I mean, seafaring vessels were common, you know, for thousands of years. It's just that um, they might have had a different name for it than Antarctica. And another reason I believe that area of the ocean is so active, Christopher Columbus himself wrote of an encounter he had of an E.T. Yeah, so, I remember that. Something's there. In fact, I heard that he either had to go before the Inquisition or almost had to go before the Inquisition because he reported seeing a UFO. Right, exactly. Now, 
Here's, I'm going to ask you a question and you tell me. Are you familiar with Oak Island? With what? Oak Island and the money pit. Yeah, Oak Island. I know the guy that was uh, doing the research on it. I just haven't talked to him in over two years, but uh, he's done a lot of research and uh, he knows that there's a money pit down there somewhere. The problem is it's booby trapped all the way down. Right, right. And you can't get to it. They haven't figured out how to get to the depth of the well. Not even today they can't get to it. Now, who had that kind of technology? The Templars. <laughs> You're right. You're exactly uh, right. He believes it's a Templar treasure. You look at it like this. I've been booby traps and stuff. If God's on your side, anything is possible with God. Well, God was with the Templars. And that's why I really believe it has to do with the Templars. I also think that if the Templars buried a treasure and set booby traps, most likely it wasn't just uh, money. It probably had to do with uh, ancient scriptures that were, uh, you it's know. religious artifacts, I'm telling you. I mean, they, they weren't destroyed and they managed to get them away and they didn't want the church getting at them, so they... Put them in How Oak Island and booby trapped it to keep them safe for a future date is what I think may have happened. How long did the Templars dig under the mount, under the stone? The, uh, that was so another that interesting question, and this here has come up before. <clears throat> they were da they were digging in, under the temple for many years, you know, there before they left it, when they were granted permission to, you know, work there. <clears throat> but they, uh, many people believe that they uh, found the Ark of the Covenant. I believe they found the Ark. I believe the Ark is in Ethiopia. It's either in Ethiopia or it very well could be part of the treasure at Oak Island. I don't believe it's part of the treasure at Oak Island. I, I think it's in Ethiopia because, of course, there is no history, written history of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba and their son Malak. But here we go. It's a question of faith. Well, there's another thing that's come up recently. Well, I say recently. The man who posted this is dead now. And he's made a lot of wild claims that he's found Noah's Ark. He's found the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant and, you know, two other major biblical finds which nobody finds that much in one lifetime that I've ever heard of, but he claims that he found the Ark of the Covenant underneath Calvary, under the cro the area where there was a crack in the earth where Jesus' cross used to be, and that Jesus' blood dripped down on the mercy seat, and that he had the blood tested, and it was missing uh, a male chromosome, uh, proving that uh, no, uh, yeah, proving that it, they had no father. In other words. I've got another thing about blood testing. If you, okay, listen to this. <laughs> Just recently, Italian scientists have retested the Shroud of Turin. There's blood on the cloth. They were able to analyze the blood. They got a blood type. It was O, the universal blood type. Oh, Does whoa. that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but you got caught my attention when you said blood type O. I got it a question. Is. Was it positive or negative? That's very important. Positive. Positive. I positive. That's very important to the possibility of extraterrestrial visitation. Now, how's that? Well, simple. If there's any truth to the Bible, and I'm quite sure it's not all false. There was an original Adam and Eve, and there was God created all men of one blood to live upon the earth. Then there had to be an originally an O positive or an O negative, and if there was, uh, you know, other blood types, they had to get introduced later on, in other words. so but Yeah, you think of the O positive. Well, my thought that's is... That's compatible. I mean, you know... My thought is the O positive would have been the, the one that would have been on the planet, and O negative would have been the one coming from the outside source. But they say it's O positive. In any way, those Italian scientists came up with a theory that the shroud is 95% authentic. 
I knew it. I knew it. I saw something. Well, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Buzz. And there's something else about the image on the shroud. It's only, you don't even go through the first layer of, of the cloth. It's like a half a layer of cloth. And there's only one thing I know that could make that. That would be radiation. Yeah, I've, I've heard about that on TV. Radiation be here in the resurrection. I heard about that on TV. So, that's enough for me. I just wish that they could find the bones of Mary Magdalene or Mary, Jesus' mother Mary, you know. There's nobody here to do any DNA testing, but maybe we could find out something. Hmm. Well, now I don't know about this, but according to Wikipedia, Adler, Adler's findings identified the blood as AB group, but that could, that's, could be an old... Uh, Information it's at uh, Wikipedia. This so they, only happened like two months ago. Yeah, that may not be up yet. Because I mean, when I saw it, I mean, I was excited. I, if I could have done cartwheel choice, I would have. <laughs> I'm like, God, you know, something that I believe has been proven to have a 95 percent authenticity. I mean, you know, I thrilled me. It would thrill me, too. But I, I, I want to find some more out about that if I can, because if I can get a guest on it, I think it would make a really interesting show. Oh, uh, wouldn't it, though? Now, aside from this upcoming book, uh, Restraint of the Prophets, do you have anything else going on, like any book signings? Uh, are you thinking about getting a social network or, you know? Uh, yeah, any... I've, got a, I've got a new PR guy, and he's going to be doing all that. Okay, so you don't know if you're going to have any. You don't know if you're going to any workshops, in other words? Not yet, but in the future. Because I know we're going, he's going to do like real radio. Right now he's trying to get me on George Newry Coast to Coast AM. Oh, wow. And he's going to put me several television spots as it goes on. TV spots. That's interesting. Now, didn't you also tell me before that they were going to use your book of Atlantis for a, a movie? They were, but they wanted to mess with the story topic, and I wouldn't do it. What did they want to do to the story topic? Add or delete, I don't know, but the story topic remains the same. Because if you mess with the topic, you're going to mess up the whole thing. <laughs> By topic, you mean the title? No, certain things in the story, huh? -uh. Okay. My story stays as is. But that's all right. It'll get there eventually. Just got to have those right eyes. Now, Sandy in the chat room just asked if you're prepared for it to not be real, but I'm not sure what she's referring to. For not the plot to be real. That's what I mean. I'm not sure what she's I referring to. I don't understand. To. <laughs> uh, it was probably something you said a few minutes ago when we... Got past it before she could type it. You know, I'm just like everybody else out there that has their own theory, their own belief system. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If I'm right, hey, I'm right, you know? Yeah, I don't think it's really good to get too hung up on your what you believe and, you know, etch it into stone. <clears throat> because when we find out that we're wrong, we're eating exactly. a lot of cheese, you know what I'm saying? It's better to... uh almost believe than to totally believe in unless you really got absolutely concrete belief. Why do you I mean, think uh, I proof, I'm fiction. sorry, proof. Why do you think I like fiction? <laughs> that way I can present my viewpoints. People can read them. I, I want to make people think, I guess that's what it all amounts to, that these certain things could be possible. Then again, they couldn't be. Okay, she meant uh, she meant the shroud, but you've already said that you really believed that it was real. But then Absolutely. again, that doesn't mean that you're prepared 
to find out that it's not. <laughs> well, that's what I'd be disappointed if I found out it wasn't. That I wouldn't be overcome by it, you know. But, but you know, there's a lot of evidence in the favor of it being a, a genuine artifact, and I think the evidence does outweigh. However, uh, one of the big questions I think you really have to ask, though, who had the technology to put the radiation on it back then, and why would they want to do it? I mean, it's not... They like didn't even know about radiation back then. The shroud did not appear until the 13th century. That was at the time of Templars. And then finally, oh, you think about this. It appeared in France. The Templar headquarter was in France. So I believe the Templars found it under the mount. I mean, that's what I believe. And then very well they could have. I think it was found um, during a picture shoot, wasn't it? Or I don't know exactly how it was found. But I do know it was found. The family that had it gave it to this religious order. They had a fire. The shroud was burned somewhat. And that would mess up your carbon dating right there. Because the smut and stuff that was on it. You know, maybe I'm wrong. I may be wrong. But you know, if I'm right... Hey, hopefully I have made me a little place up yonder, you know. Well, you know, many people say that they they personally believe that the uh, face in the shroud is Leonardo da Vinci's face. Absolutely not. No, I'm not saying that is the case. I'm just saying that's what they believe. Yeah, but they, it doesn't even look like his face. You go to the Vitruvian man that he did. Or you go to... Uh, other sketches that he made. Even the self-portrait he did of himself, a sketch. They don't look alike. Not in the least, I don't think. Well, how did Da Vinci even get connected with it? How did Da Vinci... Get connected to it? Yeah, I mean, did he ever have Alchemy. access to it? Oh. Alchemy. Al Alchemy. Oh, to the shroud. I don't know how he got to the shroud. But I do know his beliefs of alchemy and everything almost made him die. Because <laughs> he was so far ahead of his time. Well, yeah, and they also say that he had uh, secreted some of his research that to this day has not been found. Exactly. And then some people say this, that the Templars have access to it in the town of Hereford. Get this, Royce, that found one of his workshops. And guess where it was? The one I just mentioned in Hereford? Within the Vatican is the one I'm talking about. Really? Really. This hadn't been found very long, I think six or seven months. But they were doing something, they found this old workshop. And they had, they, there was some sketches in there they found. And sure enough, they were Da Vinci. What would he be doing in the van again? Well, actually, he was in, uh. Yeah. He was in, uh, Italy, wasn't he? Yes, he was. He was trying to cover up his place, I would imagine. Because that was during the Inquisitions and, you know. Not not a good place to be at the time. Hmm. I want to look that up, too. That's pretty interesting to, that somebody into alchemy would actually manage to find a, a secret workshop inside the Vatican. But, you know, it's not too far-fetched. Leonardo was a genius. I mean, the man, helicopters, you know, tanks. Well, Airplanes. He did invent a car. It was a bit primitive, but it was a car nonetheless. It could run. Yeah, it did. I mean, it didn't have a motor as we understand it. And do you know how he made his money for a while? He designed weapons for Italy. 
and some of those weapons were way ahead of the time. There were a lot of people back then that were uh, designing, well, I say a lot, at least a couple of people back then that were designing similar weapons that he was. Um, but, I mean, like you're talking within a 200, 300 year time span of each other. You ask me this. I've always thought that the United States was the new Jerusalem. Our country is not yet 300 years old. Look how far we have came in that amount of time. It's mind-blowing. Have you ever read um, Francis Bacon's work, uh, New Atlantis? Uh-uh. Okay, he um, gets shipwrecked at this island, and they take him and his crew in, and they nurture him, and he gets to be friends with the king, and and Francis starts describing a new Atlantis that they're going to found and build, and he describes uh, some of the things they're going to have. He talks about metal birds and synthetics, uh, you know, uh, you know, things that taste like. Th- uh, Fruit juices that aren't really derived from fruits or, you know, other synthetic type things that describe some of the stuff we have here today. So a lot of people think that, you know, his intention or the intention of uh, Francis Bacon and his crew was to found New Atlantis here where America's at. Could be possible. <laughs> Which, you know, New Jerusalem, Atlantis has been equated, equated with New Jerusalem. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I believe in my very fiber that the U.S. is the New Jerusalem. And, you know, you go thinking about, okay, one of the things that has to happen before Christ comes back is the rising of Solomon's temple for a third time. And right now, the dome of the rocks on there How's that going to be accomplished? When Iran finally bombs Jerusalem, it'll be destroyed, then the architects stand by, and they'll raise the temple again. Now, I, I, was. I thought they wanted to raise a mosque, not the temple. Temple. The, Solomon, the temple of Solomon has to arise before Christ comes back. You sure the Jews ain't going to bomb Iran and then them do it? Either way, one or the other, who knows? <laughs> I know of Netanyahu gets any, anything from Iran like they're going to bomb Israel or something, they'll retaliate. Because that man don't say nothing. <laughs> but, you know. Well, it sounds like you got some uh, new material for new books out here. Maybe. <laughs> You're going to be busy writing. You're never going to get to stop. Yeah, I've got my next four books planned. You're going to have to write yourself all the way into your grave. Yeah, my publisher signed me for life, so. <laughs> and who is your but publisher? My next four books, like I say, after I finish this, is about the age of aliens. The next book I'm going to do is about Titanic, but I'm doing it. Through the eyes of the dial on the floor of the ocean. Then I'm going to write Everlanta 6. Mm hmm. So that's what I got planned. I also have another book called A Thorn Within the Roses. It's about a female serial killer slave. But she goes nuts because her mother is killed. Under the sun, picking cotton because of the master, and you think the think of the the think this just like a uh, rose bush, a slave is more or less grounded to the ground of a plantation, and each rose bush has a thorn, and the thorn in this book this bush is the master. Give you something to think about. I'm weird. Is that my husband says I'm weird? 
I thought that was my job. I don't know. You're working that with me. <laughs> well, Linnea, uh, have, you think we've pretty well covered all the subject, or is there something you think I might have missed? No, I think we've pretty much covered it. I was going to say, we've been on this here for about a roughly hour and a half now, and I don't want to, you know, talk my listeners' ears off totally. Uh, not when I hope to have them back again uh before too much time goes by, when do you think this uh, book, Restraint of the Prophets, will be coming out? I'm happy to finish it by Christmas. By Christmas. So, uh, you know what? I'm booking October now, so we need to reserve a time for you, uh, you know, in advance that will be close to that book. I think it would be a good thing. What do you think? Right now, I'll shoot for January because I can't write it like, a lot of writers can sit down and write a whole chapter a day. I can't do that. I keep my mind fresh because the content is my job, and it's going to be good. Okay. Oh, we can make that for January because I ain't booked anything in January now. Yeah, you can just pick any Tuesday or any um, Saturday, Tuesday night at 8, Saturday at 1, and Either just tell, tell me which one you want, and I'll slap it on there. Saturday at 1. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll pick a Saturday and tell you which one, or I'll call you later. But I was going to say... Oh, I'm getting ready to sing you second and stop on at Atlanta. Okay, cool. Sounds like a winner to me. You grab the first down the second will make sense. <laughs> okay. Um, now, that one is all about the crystal skull of the belief. Oh. And the Mayan Day prophecy. About that, before we go... The prophecy are you referring to, is that the one where at the end of days, the uh, skulls are supposed to be found, and when they're put in a circle, they're supposed to transmit information? Uh-huh. Exactly. Now, what I read about them was that uh, the early Mayans had the technology and the uh, psychic ability to transfer information from their minds into these skulls psychically, and these skulls had the ability to store this information for future reference. Very possible. Because as you know, crystal is one of the best things you can use for storing information. No, I have, go ahead. And you know, I just believe they hadn't found them. They haven't found them all yet because we're not ready. Well, I know that a lot of people think that story's just uh, total bunk. Now, we really can't say for sure unless that they're actually found. Uh, how, some of the ones that's been found now, where have they been found at? And I know one's been in Belize. That was the name with Mitchell Hedges. Max. The one, the other one that travels around. I believe he was found there for least two. So, I would imagine all of them should be found where the Mayans used to rule. That would be my guess. Well, you know, Edgar Casey talks about a uh, three places where the ancients hid records. Uh, one was the Hall of Records, supposedly under the Sphinx. One was in Bimini. What was the other one? <laughs> in Bimini. Okay. And the last one was in the Yucatan, and we all know the Mayan was right there in the Yucatan Peninsula. Exactly. And not far from there, I think, was the uh, cave that had the metal library in it, and who knows what else, that uh, we're not allowed to go into and research anymore. After the initial research found them, uh, they had. They had. They had that drives some, me crazy. They had some kind of war or something, and the government said we can't go in there and research anymore, or you know, dig anymore. And who knows if the, the, some of those skulls weren't in there by that middle library? Kind of sounds like Egypt, <clears throat> doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Because that's why well, we can't go in there and, and study the Hall of Records anymore, too. What are they hiding? That's what I want to know. So. Yeah, the thing is, if you can find the one by Bimini, that's all under the American government. How are they going to tell us that we can't investigate that one? 
I don't know, but I do know when they found those underground echoes off the coast of Cuba, Castro put a stop to that. Hmm. But, I mean, you know, I don't know. Ah, you, there's, a, there's a million theories that could be out there, you know. I'm still curious to see what they'd find under that sphinx if they actually got to go in there and investigate oh, that yeah. doorway. You know, the thing is caved in. It is caved in. But they could clean the thing out, you know. Yeah, there's ways to get around cave-ins. That doesn't necessarily have to, you know, be a showstopper. They can shore up the uh, ceiling and the walls, clean out the debris, and, you know, or go around it and make another entrance and what have you. Absolutely right. They just don't want to go in there. Maybe they know something we don't know. Well, I don't believe they put a door in the Sphinx just so they can open and close it. Well, I think the Sphinx, 5,000 years old, that's a baby. I think I think it's like 50, 75,000 years. Who knows? Maybe that door between the paws is just a, uh, no, it was the left front paw, wasn't it? Maybe it's just a broom closet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, a big one at that. (laughs) But, yeah, they say that there's tunnels running from the Sphinx to the Pyramid. The Great Pyramid, yes. I've heard that. Have you heard the analogy that the Great Pyramid was a power source? Actually, I've had Christopher Dunn on, and I think he was the one that wrote the book about it, if I'm not mistaken. Seems plausible to me. Could very well be. I mean, I've had him on, and I think he called it the Giza Power Plant. I, it was him or somebody else, and I'm getting them, uh, you know, mixed up, in other words. But I have had somebody on before that was uh, talking about the uh, Giza Pyramid being a power plant. But we got another guy that thinks it uh, was a water uh, source as well. How? <clears throat> Oh no! They, uh, the hydrogen pump, they, makes more sense to me. <laughs> they think that uh, it was a, like a water pump, and that they use water to raise the blocks to the top. But that just sounds weird to me. No, you go like to Puma Puka, where you know there's these gigantic twenty-ton blocks of stone that are fit together like a jigsaw puzzle with no mortar. Now, you tell me how that was done. Okay, now, Sandy in the chat room just said she was trying to say before she had trouble with the chat room that uh, someone went to the trouble of making these crystal skulls, and she finds it hard to believe they were just for decoration. They're not just for decoration. I'm telling you, they were related to a Right. The high castle was 13. There's 13 crystal skulls. I don't think that's a coincidence. Well, according to Edgar Casey, it's not. <laughs> now, did, uh, Edgar Casey, he mentioned the um, crystal firestones that they use for energy. Right. And then supposedly this is what destroyed them. What really gets me going about Edgar Casey? If the government did not pay him attention, in the United States somewhere there's this archive of stuff, history, and mess has been stored. In that archive, they have a thousand of Edgar Casey's prophecies. Why would they bother if he was just a run-of-the-mill psychic, you know? Well, it wasn't just his prophecies. It was also his readings. Man never graduated high school, and he could go into a trance, and if a person was having medical trouble, he could tell them what was wrong with them. Then he could tell them how to cure it, and he never graduated high school. He also had the ability to tell somebody from a thousand miles away where he had never been, where at on the, in their store on their medicine shelf, they could find what he was looking for. Right. That's, it is called remote viewing. 
the government should have spent a lot, a lot of money in remote viewing for there to be nothing to it. And remote viewing was pretty um, common. Uh, you know, actually, trying to remember back when I was reading your book, didn't the bad guy, and I can't remember his name, uh, that Eric. was after, huh? Yurik, yeah, him. Didn't he use remote viewing to tell him when uh, Archimedes was sneaking up on him? Yes, it is. See, my memory's better than you think. You're bringing up things I've got about. <laughs> but no, I mean, the way that they usually communicated was through, like, remote viewing, telekinesis, being psychic, you know. To me, that would have been a part of Atlantis. Because my belief is these people were so far advanced, they could use their minds. Well, you know, astronaut Edgar Mitchell started the uh, sci uh, Foundation for Noetic Sciences, I think it's called, to just uh, study this kind of phenomena, different forms of ESP. You know what I think ESP is? As of right now, we only know 15% of what our brains could do. I think people that have the ability to be psychic, remote viewing, they're in tune to a part of the brain that the rest of us aren't yet. I believe everybody can do it, but I believe we just hang up. Most mainstream people just don't have the ability yet. But I'm well, to the mind. We know that if you go by the Bible, which it may or may not be accurate on this, uh, only the prophets seem to have this ability back in ancient times. However, they don't list what was going on in Egypt or uh, other places as far as right, this right. here goes. And, you know, they did talk about false prophets, which a lot of times would be any prophet from anywhere other than Israel. I think about prophets like a Jim Jones, David Koresh, people like that. Yeah, you know, those would be false prophets. Right. But who knows? You know, if the Council of Atlantis was extraterrestrial, and they had the ability to use their minds, and part of our heritage is extraterrestrial maybe these people like I say are into a part of the brain that we aren't and they went through the genes who knows well I think it's all related to energy I think I it agree. has to be <clears throat> some kind of a combination maybe between energy and information and how they interact because uh, well I mean it only makes sense that nothing moves without energy exactly and everything has to have information to tell it where to move. What is the paranormal? Not the normal. I mean, <laughs> you know, spirits, what are they? They're energy. And we're energy. energy. Spirits are energy. Uh, we're energy. Angels are energy. Uh, uh, God is energy. Uh, you know, everything is energy in the end. That's right. And there I go back. Energy cannot be destroyed. And energy animates. So how do, how do you use the energy yourself? How do you consciously use the energy instead of it just ha happening by random? We know we use our brain to send an energetic signal through our nerves to move our fingers, arms, and feet and that. But how many other ways does it work? You got it. See? You don't know. Maybe one day. Well, it could have to do with that opening up to the chakras the Hindus talk about. True. Maybe some people have opened up their chakras and other ones haven't. Exactly. Now, we know like Edgar Casey. Go, go ahead. Some people are, are more advanced than others as far as what they can do with the brains. It all goes down to mind control, I think. Us controlling our own mind. Okay, you got a question in the chat room. Do you have any conflict between a belief in God and a belief that we could have alien DNA, etc.? 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. Just because our forefathers said angels visited them, go to the Old Testament, look at the book Ezekiel, where Ezekiel describes seeing God on a machine. Why would God need a machine? And, you know, if there are extraterrestrials out there, it's just like Christ himself said, my father, creator of the universe, that doesn't just mean that he created us. Well, you know, Jesus also said he had a sheep of another fold, but he didn't say where they were at. Right. Could have been on Mars, could have been in America, could have been in the Yucatan. I mean, sheep of another fold, where at? I mean, there's no specifics. It's open to interpretation. Exactly. See, that's what religion is all about. God gave man free choice. And it's up to each one of us to what we believe. God gave us free choice. Everything I think is a matter of faith. As far as religion goes, but I have no problem with extraterrestrials and God. The only thing that would show me is God is a lot greater than I thought he was. If he, you know, put other people, other beings on other planets, that takes a mighty powerful entity. Well, I mean, if you can do it on one, he can always do it on others, though. <clears throat> it takes as much power to do it here as it does on uh, the moon or Mars or somewhere. Right. Mm. And there's no reason to really think that he uh, didn't. I mean, it's not being as wasteful as the other Have belief is. Have you heard the theory the moon is hollow? Yeah, actually I have. This has what been a, a real me? popular since they um, sent a, uh, a missile or a bomb up there and it made a bell ringing sound. Correct. Then wouldn't that be funny? It'd be a, a, a what do you call it? A, some kind of station. Uh, some kind of station for the ETs before they got to Earth. It's funny you should mention that because uh, if you go to Richard Hoagland's uh, website, he has an article up about Hephaestus, the moon of Saturn, and I got pictures of it. And I swear it looks like the Death Star from Star Wars. Frozen, frozen, and he does a whole article on what if it's a dead Death Star. Couldn't the moon be the same thing? Exactly. I mean, it's way beyond our technological grasp. However, if there's other life elsewhere, who's to say what their technological grasp is? really makes me mad about scientists. When they go to look for life, water has got to be there. Who said extraterrestrials needed water like we do? That depends on whether or not they get thirsty. <laughs> Maybe they're more advanced than that. I would hope our brethren are so far <laughs> advanced that violence is no longer a part of their society. I would hope they'd be that far advanced. Well, that'd be pretty bad if they were planet hopping and, and looking for war. That'd be no, scary. For real. <laughs> we wouldn't have a chance. <laughs> well, no. If they I have mean, the, if they have the technology to use their minds and stuff, we're not there yet. No, not quite. But we're on the verge. Yeah, we are. We are. But, you know, that's why I write my fiction and ask my questions. <laughs> Because, I mean, you know, like this one book I'm doing with Strength with the Prophet. I thought about writing it ever since I started writing, but I had to feel I was ready. If I'm going to write about something I fervently believe or believe in, I want my passion to be in the book. So, But I tell you, if anybody reads one of my books, they got to read a book like any other. <laughs> well, they got a lot ideas, of books out there and a lot of theories out there. All my ideas are unique. They've never been to film. 
I make sure of that. Because that's what's... And I take on things that other authors would shy away from. I don't care. I mean, you know, I can't please everybody. I just go by the main thing, be true to myself. Exactly. Got to be true to yourself before you can be true to God. You're exactly right. Well, Sandy, we've been at this almost a... I'm Sandy. Uh, she just typed in the uh, chat room, people believe in evadings exist. God doesn't. My belief is God created all beings. And I told her I agreed with her. And I had her on the mind and I called you her. <laughs> Hi, Sandy. So I was going to say that it's uh, ten minutes to three. We've been on here a couple of hours now. And I was going to ask you if you had any last minute thoughts. No, I just, I just want people to read my books. And I just wanted to think. I'm not trying to put any of my beliefs on anybody. I just think about it, you know? Right. And again, you can find her books on Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, and she's got links to them at www.linneaslayer.com. And you can learn a lot more about her. You can also learn about her uh, poetry that Victor Ariolis and her have been putting in a musical format. Oh, and Sandy says she has no doubt that you put your heart into your book. Yes, I do. <laughs> Mind, body, heart, and soul. And since I've got to get supper ready for my boys and me, I'm going to call this one here a wrap. We'll uh, get a date down tomorrow, the next day, for uh, January, and we'll talk at a later date. And, uh, Linnea, good. it's always a pleasure to have you here. And, you know, you're a very frequent guest of mine, and I really appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in January. I'll be here. Uh, okay, no. You have a good okay, one. Okay, bye, dear. Bye, buddy. Bye-bye, everyone. I mean, uh, Linnea, i got to tell them what's coming up next real quick before I cut them loose. All right, you have a good one. All righty, everybody. Give me just one quick second. And um, let me make sure I didn't disconnect myself when I disconnected her. Um, no, I still show to be on. And I wanted to mention everybody once again Tuesday. My guest will be uh, Jim Ocon. We'll be talking about Lost Secrets of Maya Technology. The man's had a really fantastically interesting book, really in-depth, really informative, and I'm looking forward to talking to him. Also, before you go, wanted to remind you guys that we just um, we just passed World UFO Day, but if you want to keep it in mind for the next one that comes around, the uh, logo to it is on the right-hand side up close to the top. And don't forget to visit my friends. At the, uh, well, let me open up a fresh page for that. At uh, Supernatural UFO, you click on the friends link on the left under other, and you'll find them. And there's also United Paranormal International, both great sites. I would just ignore the Alien UFO community banner. Uh, they've been shut down. Uh, you know, Ning charges nowadays, and sometimes people can't afford to pay, even though they try. So maybe that's what's happening, and maybe he's trying to get back on. Also, if you want to hear some other good radio shows, I, I recommend UKPN Radio with uh, host Gary Brown. And you, if you, you can find these banners by clicking on Radio Favorites. Under uh, other as well, just a little further down. JimHerald.com, The Gradient Report, our, uh, host Micah Hanks, by the way, and Ohio Exopolitics by Mark Sni uh, Snyder. I recommend all of these shows. Uh, most of them have actually been on my show. They're really, um, you know, good uh, hosts and they really have great shows. And with that, I'm going to bid everybody a good weekend and call this show a wrap for myself so I can get to dinner. 
And y'all have a good one, folks. Don't forget, I couldn't have a show without my listeners any more than I could have one without my guests. And also, don't forget to spread the word about my show. Invite your friends over. Remind them that uh, membership is free. They can sign up for the newsletter. It helps them get into chat. And we can maybe build a chat and have more people to talk over here. And until the next time, you folks have a fantastic weekend and enjoy yourselves. Uh, Good day. And lore, there's supposed to be a crusader that makes an appearance to right the evil. And that's about all I can say. (laughs) (laughs) Well, actually, though, it would make a lot of sense, and it goes along with a lot of uh, articles I've read online about Atlantis. A lot of people do believe that, you know, originally many Earthlings uh, started either on Lyria and came to Earth and became the first, um, you know, Atlanteans. And, you know, they were really from a more spiritually advanced uh, culture there. So they had abilities that we don't have now that we lost over a period of time and that periodically an avatar comes back, which is similar to what you were saying. Exactly. There is no doubt in my mind or in my being (laughs) That Atlantis did not did it. There, it, 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 it existed. I get out there. <laughs> There's too much. When I did the research, I found that adds up to there was an Atlantis than that that adds up that there wasn't an Atlantis. I but, mean, even where I think Atlantis was is a strange area. Because, you know, most everything that happens in Earth, as far as with vortexes and stuff like that, is electromagnetic. We sure have a lot of those vortexes all over the Earth, I think. That would be like a place that was like Stonehenge, Sedona, Arizona, where you can feel the vibrations of the Earth. It's real. Now, some people would theorize that these um, monuments of Stonehenge and some of the others around the world, like Baalbek, were really uh, built by descendants of Atlanteans, if not Atlanteans themselves, or Atlanteans helping uh, the native folk. Well, if the Atlanteans were not there, I believe they used Atlantean technology. Or technology from another place, there is no way. That I think, you know, like the Great Pyramid, they said it took 20 years to build. That's fine. But I mean, they are, it's like, like to the, the constellation of Orion itself, it's right on. I mean, you know, it has something to do with the equinoxes, the vortexes, energy. It's all energy. You know and, what? And There's a place in Ohio. Where they say there, uh, there's such a vortex that exists now that you can t- <coughs> go to and actually see it, as I understand it, if I understand it correctly. Hmm. We have a place like that in North Carolina. It's in the mountains, and I can't think of the name of the place, but it defies gravity. It, you know, the the... You can feel the energy. I, I went there one time when I was younger, and it was just unbelievable. It was all energy. Well, you know, from what I've studied about ley lines, every site around the world almost, uh, you know, Stonehenge, the Great Pyramid, uh, the Baalbek, and, you know, what have you, is... Um, Machu Picchu. They're all places... <laughs> They're all placed on a ley line located at latitude 33, or yeah. near or near latitude 33. Did it ever occur to you that maybe these places were signposts for extraterrestrials to find their way around? I or about maybe that. A dimensional doors? Uh, exactly, because it was Einstein that said himself, for each known dimension there is an innumerable amount of unknown dimensions 
So, hey, he was one of the most brilliant men, I think, of the past 300 years. I believe him. <laughs> well, I know I've read a lot about these vortexes, and I've never actually been to one and seen one myself. But it's not impossible to believe that they're around, and we don't know what all, uh, you know, the world's made of and our dimensions are made of. We don't know if there's any openings unless somebody actually goes and finds one and, and can prove they found it, in other words. Exactly right. We live in a vast universe. And I think I read on the NASA website that there are like 380 galaxies in our universe. It'd be kind of us to be kind of, you know, conceited to think we were the only intelligent beings out there. I don't buy it. I think that'd be a little bit arrogant, to be honest with you. I Absolutely. Mean, you're calling God wasteful. He put all these vast planets out there, what, just so they can run around and play pool with themselves? <laughs> I mean, really, you know? But, you know, if people really want to know the history of our Earth, they have to dig, because our history is below ground. That's like in the ocean. They don't even know what's in the ocean. And some of these places they find in the ocean, they're simply fascinating. But they have not yet found the planet. They're not looking in the right place. Atlantis. Atlantis is right off the coast of Florida. Me and my son John were discussing about the location of Atlantis at the dinner table the other day. And he mentioned the Pangea theory. And what if Atlantis is now several different countries across the... <laughs> Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, where truth equals reality and truth is often stranger than fiction hello everyone welcome to paranormal palace radio this is your host royce the redneck radio man and joining me today is linnea lee we're going to be talking about her book of atlantis uh at least for part of the show but we also wanted to devote some time to a book she's got coming out in the near future that uh, well, it deals with uh, the early church and some of the things that not everybody knows about the early church. Uh, she told me that the title of the book uh, yesterday, I think it was, on the phone, and I'll be doggone if it's not slipping my mind. I think it was something about the restraint of the uh, apostles, if I, I mean the prophets, if I understood or, or remember it correctly. But we can get into that in a minute, and she can correct me. But for right now, let's go ahead and bring her on. Oh, wait, before we do... For those of you that have questions, the call-in number is 832-632-7904. And also, if uh, y'all want to learn more about Linnea, you go to www.linneaslayer.com. The link is under her picture uh, below the chat room and the phone information in the description there, along with a link to our book of Atlantis. And I'm posting this information into the chat room. Uh, Linnea, how are you doing today? Doing fine. Hating this muggy weather. Now, I got a question in the chat room. Wanted me to ask you what your nickname is. Oh, here we go. I know, I know who that's from. Okay. I'm in a wheelchair. That means I sit. I'm a Taurus. That means I'm a bull. Yeah, sitting Best bull. We have sitting bull. <laughs> I, I saw that coming when you said you was a Taurus. I knew the rest. <laughs> yeah, yep. So, that must have been your other half with a sense of humor. My worst half. <laughs> I wasn't going to use that terminology. <laughs> but I do. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been married? Please pardon me. It's uh, it's humid over here where I'm at. We're having rain every day, and that's affecting me and causing me to have extra congestion. So just overlook that. Oh, I've been married for like 25 years. 18 for me. Oh, you see, you're just a newcomer to this. (laughs) My third one, uh, uh, no more. 
So, Linnea, you sent me a copy of your book, and I read it. And I, t- I tell you, it was a really a great book. And I got up to one certain point, and it tripped me out. Uh blew my mind for a minute there because continents from each other were when the uh, Pangaea split up. Uh, you know, some of Atlantis ended up by Europe, some over here by America, and it's no longer recognizable as it was. I disagree. No, we were I talking about this as a possibility. Right, but I think Atlantis was totally destroyed. But I tell you, it's in the area of Puerto Rico. 75 miles off the coast of Puerto Rico is the Puerto Rican Trench. This thing is 5 miles wide. It's 1,100 miles long and 5 miles below sea level. We have not yet conquered that depth. When we do, I think they will find remnants. They may not find them. I don't think it will be intact, but I think they'll find remnants. Well, what do you suppose they haven't mastered that depth? I mean, is it not safe for a human being, but they can send maybe a, a camera down there maybe that ain't a human being? I don't think they could even go that. I don't even think a camera would go that deep right now. Because you look at Titanic, it was, it's two and a half miles below sea level. And even that, you know, it's kind, was kind of chintz. So you're talking about two and a half more miles. That's a long way. And it's, it's, if they ever co- overcome the water pressure, because if they were to sit down like a little way about submersible, it'd probably be crushed or implode by all that pressure. Hmm. Unless they had some means of displacing the water around the immediate facility of the submersible. Well, if they've come that far, I want to know. Because I don't think so. Well, I'm just thinking about what would be a way they could if they wanted to. But my guess is they're just not trying to find a way to get down that far. Absolutely. Well, that's like the next book I'm writing, which is nothing about a letter. I just think, you know, we haven't been told everything about our history. Which is and part of the we, reason why you wrote Atlantis, wasn't it? Yes. And what we did know at one time has been lost over the years. That's like you go to Egypt and you think about Alexandria, Cleopatra City, that the library was, that was burnt. There's also another one called the Labyrinth. They have found where it is. But why won't Egypt let them dig? They've also found tunnels and caverns beneath the piles of the Sphinx, which Edgar Casey said that would be the Atlantean repository. It's there. It's caved in. But we can't dig. Why? Okay. Now... One of the guests I asked how the sound was okay mentioned that you could be louder. He was having a little trouble hearing you. And I turned the broadcaster up. I'm waiting to see if he uh, can hear better now. I don't know if it's in my settings because uh, he's had trouble understanding guests before, and it could be. Uh, it time traveled on me suddenly out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> kind of shocking, huh? <laughs> but it was still a good read, and it was a very interesting story, and... I could tell that a lot of it was, uh, you know, a novel that was based around research that you've done on Atlantis, evidently. Not necessarily. My mom was a teacher. She introduced me to Plato's Atlantis when I was five. Now I'm 55. I've had 50 years to gain all that knowledge. (laughs) So, not much research that's all in my head. Well, I don't know how much of that I can talk about without giving away too much of the book. Uh, I know that at the very end, that part you mentioned about uh, Orion's belt and the uh, Archimedes, is that something you'd be willing to share with them, or is that giving away too much? No, of course I had to bring extraterrestrials in. (laughs) About Archimedes? uh, Archimedes, Archimedes. Archimedes, however you pronounce it, but about him being an ET, in other words, or a descendant of an ET. Uh, Correct. You know, Correct. from the from the basis of the story, he would have been what uh, Zachariah Sitchin termed as a demigod. Right. Half human, half god. 
But you've also, I've, well, the reason I chose extraterrestrials for the book is if you know anything about Edgar Casey. I know he, almost everything about Edgar Casey. <laughs> he claimed he was led by the High Council of Atlantis, which consisted of 13 not of this earth. Think about this, too. There are 13 crystal skulls of belief. I mean, that just fascinates me. There's something there. And in fact, your next book uh, after of Atlantis was called The Crystal Skulls of Salvation. Correct. That was part two of Atlantis. There's five volumes in all of Atlantis. Okay, now, how many of those volumes have been done so far? Published three to a waiting in the archives. Part three is waiting in the archives? No, three have been published. Four and five are waiting in the archives. Okay. And what's the title of three? The Chosen. The Chosen? No, I'm sorry. Preordained. Preordained. Okay. Uh, now, I, I know we were supposed to talk about it of Atlantis and your new book that's coming out, but and this is sidetracking, but I haven't heard of Preordained. Can you kind of give us a quick briefing on that one? Well, the only thing I can say it has something to do with the Orion history. Orion? Of like Orion. Oh, Orion. The, the the star that Archimedes and his brethren came from. And according to Orion.